Rob Taves, partner at Radical Ventures and AI columnist at Forbes. Rob, thanks so much for making time. Join us on the Ivy Podcast today. Um, before we dive in and talk all of the great stuff you, you guys are building at Radical, give us a thumbnail version of your career prior to that. H happy to, John, and, and excited to be on the podcast. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, so my very quick background, I'm a, a partner at Radical Ventures today, which is a, an early stage VC firm focused entirely on AI. And we'll spend more time talking about Radical. Um, I joined Radical last year. Prior to Radical, I spent several years at another VC firm, Highland Capital, also in the Bay Area, where I led Highland's AI investing. Um, Highland is, is a firm that's been around for a while, founded in 1988. Um, over 50 company, over 50 startups that Highland has invested in have gone on to IPO, and another 150 or so have been acquired. Um, so it was, it was exciting to be a part of that firm for a while. Prior to Highland, I spent several years in the world of autonomous vehicles. So most recently, I helped lead the strategy team at Zooks in the Bay Area. Um, Zooks is an autonomous vehicle startup that Amazon acquired in 2020 for a little bit over a billion dollars. Um, so that was, that was an exciting ride. Prior to Zooks, I spent a little bit of time in the world of policy. So I worked in the White House toward the end of President Obama's second administration, working on autonomous vehicle regulations and policies. Um, and it was, that was kind of, this was in 2015. It was the very early days of the federal government starting to think about autonomous vehicles and, and think through how could we go about uh, creating a regulatory framework that would govern them. Um, so it was a really interesting time to be there. Um, I did grad school at Harvard. I did the JD MBA, so jointly Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School. Um, and prior to that, I started my career in management consulting at Bain and Company in San Francisco. Um, so I've spent most of my career in the Bay Area. I did my undergrad at Stanford um, and you know, huge, uh, huge advocate and fan of the, of the startup tech ecosystem here. Wow, what, what a background. Uh, and thank you, thank you for sharing that. Uh, a lot to uncover, a lot to unpack through kind of your journey through kind of an operator, even, you know, and even at the government level that you spent some time uh, and then transitioning over into venture space. Tell us a little bit more about that transition period. How did you how did you how did you come about basically getting introduced to venture capital and what was the kind of the catalyst or a series of decisions that you had to make to transition onto the to onto the to the dark side, as they say, <laughs> as an investor? Yeah, I, uh, um, for me, it really, um, it came about through my engagement and involvement in the world of autonomous vehicles. Uh, so I was spending a lot of time in that world in the aftermath of my, of my time in the Obama White House. And I got put in touch with the team at Highland through a business school professor, actually, who, who knew the, the Highland partners in the, in, in the Boston office. And Highland had just recently led the Series A in an autonomous vehicle startup called Newtonomy, uh, which came out of MIT. Highland led the Series A in 2016. It was acquired uh, less than a year later by Delphi. Um, but in, in, in the midst, in, in the wake of that investment, Highland was more and more excited about spending time in the world of autonomous vehicles and, and looking at more opportunities there. So I started working with them on a part-time basis while I was in grad school. Um, focusing on autonomous vehicle, early stage autonomous vehicle startups. And this was that time period, 2016, 2017, when you probably remember there was just this Cambrian explosion of startup activity around autonomous vehicles. So it was a really exciting time to be focused there. Um, but basically I got to, it was, it was kind of a unique and rewarding experience. I got to sort of dip my toes in the water of venture on a part-time basis for a few years while I was in grad school. And uh, over the course of that experience, I kind of increasingly developed conviction that I was really excited about this career path in this field. Uh, and so when I, when I wrapped up grad school and was thinking about what I wanted to do full time, um, it made a lot of sense to, to join Highland full time. And at that point, I had, I had built a strong rapport with the partnership and had gotten to know the team there. Um, and so I transitioned to an, into a full time role. So you mentioned something developing your personal conviction in that space. Um, to take that a little bit further, some of the more successful investors or venture capital firms that at least I've researched, I've observed, are very strong proponents of having a very solid investment thesis and sticking to that rather than just following trends. 
Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. How, how did you go about developing your personal kind of investment thesis almost or your conviction that, you know, whether that's a specific area in founders that you love to invest or even an industry. Tell us a little bit more about that process. Yeah, I, I very much am a believer of this of this school of thinking that there's value in being thesis driven and thesis oriented and not just kind of opportunistically chasing after any given deal. I think there's just, there's so many layers of value to taking that approach to investing. Um, it enables you to have a prepared mind. You really, you're able to go several level, levels deeper in any given category that you're focusing on. You can develop kind of a mental model of all the top most interesting startups and founders and companies in that space and really develop a more nuanced perspective on how they relate to one another. Um, and, and you know which questions to ask. It, it lets you build a more meaningful relationship with the founders. Um, so I, I think there's a ton of value in being sort of sector oriented. And that's how I've always approached the world of VC, um, starting with, with the field of autonomous vehicles, which I've talked about. Um, but, but today, more broadly, um, I'm totally focused in uh, on AI opportunities and startups building products with machine learning at their core. And um, I, I think, you know, in terms of to your question around how, how you identify which categories you're excited about or which categories you, you decide to dive into, I think, you know, diff, d different categories can appeal to different people for any number of reasons. And there's so many different areas that make sense to dive in on. I think like what's really important is for there to be a fit between an investor's background, set of experiences, expertise, interests in the area that they're focusing on so that they can bring some credibility to it. Uh, and I also think you want to be thoughtful about, obviously this is easier said than done, but you want to be thoughtful around picking an area that you think will be enduring and meaningful over a number of years and uh, is worth investing time and effort into. And you know, so, so I think something like artificial intelligence, which we can talk about more, there, it's such a broad universe and there's so many subsectors within it and technologies and, and, and industries to look at. But as an overall investment theme, it's something I have a lot of conviction is gonna be rel as relevant 10 years from now as it is today. Um, and so it's something that, that makes sense to really dive in on and invest the time and resources to build a network in and to become more of an expert in. Right, absolutely. That's, that's, that's definitely refreshing to hear in the sense that starting early and investing more time into developing that personal investment thesis i think it's it's uh you know i've seen that being a key ingredient in a lot of you know successful investors that like you said not really following the different opportunities that are coming about but rather than sticking to a particular you know area or, or just being specialized in certain space so which leads me to a further question you obviously you're an expert and investor in AI, deep tech, you know, art, you know, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, um, and the founders that you deal with are probably most likely not first time serial entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs. Uh, not someone who just, you know, woke up one day and said, oh, I'm going to build a autonomous vehicle company. It's probably someone who had spent several years at an organization that operates in that space and that saw an opportunity and decided maybe to diverse and uh, build something in that area. So you probably dealing with experienced individuals, experienced founders. Tell us a little bit more about that kind of that initial meeting or initial set of meetings when you first meet the founders for the very first time. What are the different indicators that you look for? What do you pay attention to? How do these first set of conversations basically go? Yeah, it's a great question and it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about because you just you end up meeting so many hundreds of founders and companies every year and you have to make you have to find a way to sort of sift through them efficiently so it is I think it's it's something that every VC spends a lot of time thinking about I think you know there's so many different backgrounds that can lead to a super successful founder and CEO I've invested in people who uh, you know, we're starting a company right out of undergrad, basically, and I've invested in people who have decades of work experience and have have built, built and run organizations across all different industries. And so I think that like the, there's no one profile that makes for a successful founder. I think the key ingredients that you want to look for, uh, one is maybe more than anything, just 
kind of that that certain intangible passion and hunger and energy and excitement around building what they what they're what they're setting out to build and and just that feeling that they're ready and willing to run through walls and do whatever it takes to get done what they need to get done and, and not only the not only kind of the, the willpower and the enthusiasm but also the um the resourcefulness to be willing to do what it takes and be imaginative to get around uh, obstacles and, and to and to navigate complexities that inev inevitably will arise. So I think that kind of uh, resourcefulness, imaginativeness, the, you hear the word grit used a lot. I think that is kind of an essential ingredient for any successful founder. And then I think, um, you know, to use another kind of standard Silicon Valley cliche, but which I think it is actually valuable is that you hear the term founder market fit. I think that is really important. Um, the question is not just what is this founder impressive in the abstract? Is this a, is this an impressive person? But specifically, why is this the right person to build this particular company that he or she is is seeking to build? And so that can look like different things in different in different situations. It doesn't necessarily need to be that this founder has spent two decades studying this exact topic and now is ready to to start a company. Sometimes that is the case, but you know, it's not necessarily just about sheer number of years spent in the field, but s some complementarity between the founder's background and how they've spent their time to that point and the set of experiences that they've accumulated and what they're looking to build. And oftentimes you find there's there's a unique fit between those two. Like the founder is one of just like a small handful of people that understand the problem and have lived it and have lived in that industry in such a way that they're, they know firsthand what needs to be built to, to resolve it. So I think that that fit between the founder and the, and the business model is essential. Um, and then I think like, again, it's more intangible, but I think um, a, a coachability and a willingness to, a willingness to work together is essential. Like this is, um, you hear it said a lot that uh, like a, a, a deal, a, an investment from a VC and a partner, a VC and a, founder, you know, if it's a seed round or series A round is like a marriage. And like, even though that metaphor is like a little, feels a little extreme, like in a lot of ways, I think it actually does ring true for one thing, like probably the average marriage in America lasts less long than the average VC founder uh, engagement. Um, you know, if you think about the, the typical length to exit being seven years or 10 years or whatever it is, and you just work together very closely, you know, obviously regular board meetings, but also just day in, day out. You're, you're really, you really are partnering together in, in a deep way. And so uh, being able to have conviction that the person you're investing in is someone you want to work with, someone who is good to work with, someone who can take feedback, who can share feedback. Uh, the founder is always going to be the one in control, the one running the business calling the shots, building the business. They know the business better than anyone, but um, you also want to have someone who is willing to take external input from his, his or her board uh, and other sources. So I think that, I think that like ability to work well together, that willingness to take feedback is also really important. I love that, especially the kind of that self-awareness aspect. It's what you've mentioned oftentimes overlooked because you may take a special skill set to take the company from from A to B, uh, but once you hit a certain stage, a certain growth trajectory, it, you know you got to be so self aware in terms of your weaknesses and strengths that I may not be the right CEO to take the company from you know the the Series A and beyond. So I think uh, those are very interesting observations that you're making as you talk about um, the the founder founder market fit. So there's a lot of there's a lot of coverage and talk around value add investor, uh, where VCs, you know, say we, we bring a lot more value than just capital. And these days, especially with capital being so cheap, um, you know, one of the, you know, more common things that we, we hear in the media is our value add is just completely getting out of your way. Um, here, take our money and we'll get it out of your way and you just do your own thing. Um, and obviously, you know, you're, there's situations for that that make it right or wrong, but there's no specific formula. But what are your thoughts on the value add investor 
How do you think about that? What are your relationships with the founders in your portfolio? So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's 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 a really interesting topic. Um, you know, I, I think first of all, there there's no one right answer. As you said, I think it, even within a given firm, it really is heavily dependent on the particular company context and founder. Like even within our portfolio, there's some founders that just need and want less support and less hands-on engagement and, and other founders that, that get more value from it. So I think like it needs to be kind of a mutual understanding and, and sort of con consensual decision between the investor and, and the founder in terms of how much engagement is necessary. I do think that there are ways that VCs can add a lot of value to portfolio companies beyond capital. Um, and I th certainly there are newer, not non-traditional venture investors like the Tiger Globals of the world that are coming in kind of with this more explicit mandate of we give you capital and otherwise we get out of the way. We don't want a board seat. We don't want, we don't really want to be involved. And that can, I, that can work for some companies, but I think especially at the earlier stages, as cynical as people can be about, about the VC model and about early stage investing, like I, th I think there are a lot of ways that VCs can, and, and in our case, we do really help our, our portfolio companies. I think like there's a few different buckets. Um, probably the single most important thing that investors and board members can help early stage startups with is hiring. And honestly, like if, if there's any one thing that a founder spends most of their time thinking about and would always enjoy having more support on, it's around hiring. So I think like at, at Radical, for instance, we have an internal talent team that helps companies sort of professionalize, systematize, stand up an internal recruiting mechanism and process. And there's a lot of best practices we can share around that. But then also just kind of the, the, the more hands-on work of, of sourcing candidates, introducing uh, the right candidates, high caliber candidates to portfolio companies. Um, across the board, are, <clears throat> we've uh, helped make a ton of hires in key positions for portfolio companies. And, and that really does move the needle, especially at, at an early stage. There's nothing more important to the success of a company than the quality of the people in it. Um, so I think being able to help <laughs> founders on, on the hiring front uh, helps a ton. Um, and I think you know there are ways that you can help with go-to-market and business development introductions to the right people and the right organizations at the right time can go a really long way. Um, similarly with, with subsequent financings, that, that's kind of, that's an obvious area where existing board members and VCs, if they are hands-on and invested with the company can really make a difference in terms of setting up the right relationships based on their network of other VCs, knowing which investors may be the right fits for a given company for the next round of financing. Um, another thing I would add on this is I think one way that, that we at Radical have, have found the value add dimension to be really meaningful is through specialization, by which I mean Radical is, is a totally AI focused firm. And so all of our portfolio support is oriented around supporting AI companies and AI, AI first startups and all the, the various ways in which those companies' needs are unique from a talent perspective, from a branding perspective, from a business model perspective, et cetera. And so on a talent front, for instance, uh, to, to the earlier topic I talked through, our, our internal talent team is focused specifically on helping portfolio companies build out their, their technical ML talent, which is a very specialized value add, but for AI companies, like there's nothing more important and nothing harder than finding those top ML engineers. And so I think through our focus and specialization, we are able to add value to portfolio companies in, in very targeted ways. Right. Absolutely. I think I think hiring is such a, especially in this current market, in the way, that just the way the the market is, is, you know, it's so challenging to find, you know, qualified candidates um, because we all probably thought that going fully virtual is actually going to make things easier, but your competition also 10 x uh, with organizations uh, seeking probably the same talent. So that's, that's always interesting to, to talk about um, in terms of, uh, so I've been, I've been in, in terms of board meetings, 
I, as a founder operator, I've been on that side of the equation, that, that side of the table in a board meeting. Uh, I've been an observer as well, and as a board kind of as a board director at other companies, and it's always um, it's always hit or miss in terms of running a very productive board meeting. Um, I have my thoughts around areas that could be improved, but I'm sure you've been on different sides of the equation, different chairs uh, as as a as part of the board meetings. What what have you seen? that works really well, maybe actually on the other side, what, what are some of the things to avoid when preparing and running a board meeting that really brings value all across the board? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think <clears throat> I think the importance, in kind of in an interesting way, the importance of the board meetings themselves are inversely related, I guess directly related to how, uh, hand, how much your investors and your board members are involved on an ongoing continuous basis with the company. Um, if, if as a CEO or founder, you're uh, seeking to proactively leverage your board and involving them in the, in the company on a data, on a kind of daily, weekly basis, then the stakes are lower for the board meetings because you're kind of, folks are already pretty up to speed with what's happening. For CEOs that, have a more hands-off relationship with their board. Uh, the board meeting accordingly becomes more important because what, what's communicated there is, is you know, the, the, that's where a lot of the more important conversations happen. I think, um, you know, in terms of how I think about the best ways to run board meetings, I think a lot of it is um, is is pretty uh, sort of widely practiced in terms of um, I think communicating the high level points first and having a, a really important skill set for any CEO to have is to be able to crystallize and synthesize a, a lot of data and information coming in and to the, the few key points that are most important for them to take away and for teams to focus on. And so I think as a CEO being able to communicate very succinctly, like here are the few most important indicators of how our business is trending. And maybe more importantly, here are the few key things that I need from you. Um, the, the, the most effective CEOs I've seen are always very good at leveraging everyone on the extended team, which includes the board to get the most out of them to benefit the company. So you think, don't want that to become just another status update meeting, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, uh, exactly. T talking through and talking through ways that the board can engage. And then also I think importantly, talking through the key things that have changed from previ the previous board meeting or previous conversations to now, uh, as well as most important upcoming milestones, I think, so that you can weave together a more coherent narrative. And, and importantly, because board meetings are happening on a recurring basis every two months, every three months, um, you know, you, 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 CEOs should have some accountability to what they said in the past. So I think, as you get into a cadence with a board meeting, I think uh, setting up um, kind of retrospective, including retrospective materials around this is what we said was going to happen, this is what has happened, is a great way to, to have accountability as a CEO and to kind of keep, keep that narrative going on on an ongoing basis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love I love that you know frame of thought around board meetings because at the end of the day. As a CEO, founder of the company, it's you know it's on you to clearly communicate what type of value you need from your board members, and also as a board member, it's your responsibility to make sure that you come prepared to the yep. meeting in advance, so that it's not just you know you coming seeing seeing things for the very first time and trying to come up with something on the spot. I've seen a lot of that as well, so it just goes both ways. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, on the next question, I you know we we I'd like for you to pull out. Rob's, uh, you know, crystal ball in terms of um, some of the more around the trends that you personally very excited about. Obviously, you're very specialized. You you guys operate and invest in, in AI and you must do a lot of research in that space. Um, but for from your personal perspective, what are some of the areas that you're mostly excited about? The reason I ask this question is because a good portion of our listeners on the Ivy Podcast um, are early stage career professionals, maybe recent graduates. And some of the questions that we typically get are, what are some of the very niche areas that 
you would recommend I develop some of the skills further so that I become indispensable, I become in high, you know, in demand. Uh, so maybe if you could speak from that perspective, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the things that I love about being an AI VC is that while AI is a specialization and a, and a particular technology that we focus on, it's also such a broad horizontal technology that it encompasses so many different categories. And so there, there's, there are always new areas to look at. A couple of areas that I am particularly focused on right now that I think will have massive growth ahead of them and a lot of exciting opportunities in the months and years ahead. The first is climate tech and applications of machine learning to climate. And this is an area that I'm sure a lot of your, your listeners are aware has, has really picked up incredible momentum over the past couple of years. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not new that climate change is a challenge that's becoming increasingly threatening, but there have been really incredible tailwinds just in the past couple of years in terms of the amount of capital being committed to the problem, the seriousness with which large organizations around the world are taking the problem. And accordingly, there's, just, there's been a massive ecosystem of climate tech startups that have begun to pop up over the past year or two. And there are a lot of different dimensions of the climate problem to which AI can really meaningfully be applied. Um, so there are a lot of different interesting climate AI startups that we've been watching and, and potentially will be investing in. What, just to give kind of one more concrete example of that, one area, one category I think is really fascinating is this idea of carbon accounting. Um, and the, the big picture idea is that organizations around the world, a lot, hundreds of Fortune 500 companies and governments and others uh, want to reduce their carbon footprint and are committing to reducing their carbon footprint down to net zero emissions by a certain year. But before you can take any real meaningful concrete steps around reducing your carbon footprint, you have to know what your carbon footprint is. And that's a more complicated exercise than it might sound because you need to to, to have a really comprehensive, meaningful understanding of your carbon footprint, you need to know the carbon emissions resulting from your direct operations. So like all the cars in your fleets that you have driving around or, you know, all the electricity that you're using in your factories or in your facilities, whatever it is. But then on top of that, there are also um, kind of more indirect emissions that an organization is responsible for. They're called scope three emissions that can happen both upstream of you. So in, in your supply chain, whatever activities your suppliers are doing to, pr to provide their goods to you, that has an associated carbon footprint. And then also downstream of you to your consumers who are using your product, that can also lead to a carbon footprint. So those scope three emissions in particular are very difficult to, to assess. And so there, there's a new crop of startups popping up that are basically using data analytics and machine learning uh, to automate this process of quantifying and understanding an organization's carbon footprint. And that in itself is a big challenge with a lot of value, but then also once you position yourselves, once you position yourself as a company that kind of has this source of truth and information about a customer's carbon footprint, that you can then add a ton of value in terms of helping them come up with a plan to reduce it or develop a plan to, to buy carbon offsets, that sort of thing. Um, and, but it's all very, it's, it's, it's fundamentally a data problem. So that's, that's one really interesting area within the climate change problem. I think AI is going to have a big impact on, uh, and then a second area that I've been spending a lot of time on just to mention briefly is, um, language AI or, or natural language processing NLP as it's often referred to. Um, there has been just a ton of transformative technology developments over the past call it about five years in terms of NLP, the cutting edge in NLP. And we're just now reaching a point where that technology is kind of percolating into all sorts of different startup opportunities across industries, across sectors. And it, it sounds obvious to say, but an important kind of overarching point around this opportunity is that language is so ubiquitous to how we live our lives, how we conduct business, kind of what we do day to day, that there are, there's literally no business in the world that doesn't heavily rely on language for its operations. And so there are so many different opportunities to apply NLP, to automate language in different ways and different use cases. Uh, and there are so many different startup opportunities 
that exists around that and a lot of interesting startups that are pursuing those. So um, I've been spending a lot of time looking at kind of vertically focused or, or sector focused NLP startups that have identified a concrete business use case and are, and are applying this latest generation of AI, language AI to address it. So that's another area that I think is just going to see explosive growth in the years to come. Well, those are definitely very interesting trends that you're researching. And for you to go down these rabbit holes, um, what is your content diet looking like these days? What are the different sources that you could share with us that you consume on a daily basis, whether it's certain blogs that you read, certain videos you watch, or maybe Twitters that you follow? Just share some, 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 of, that, uh, your, some of that content diet. Yeah, my, so my content diet is, is very heavily skewed toward AI, not surprisingly. Um, there's a handful of newsletters that I read every day or every week related to AI. Um, Andrew Ng's group uh, has, a, has a weekly newsletter that I find really informative and in-depth. Um, I think it's, uh, it's called the, I think it's called The Batch, um, but it's, it's from, it's from uh, the Andrew Ng's AI fund. Um, Inside AI is another uh, newsletter that has kind of daily, it's more news oriented, but has daily updates of like the 10 most important developments in the world of AI. Um, that, that's really great to, to read. Um, I spent a ton of time reading books about AI. I think one of the interesting things about the, about the field is um, while a lot of these latest breakthroughs are new, in particular around the amount of data that's available and the amount of compute that's available, and that's driving these crazy new developments that weren't possible before. A lot of the core ideas in the field of AI have been around for decades. And kind of certainly the, 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 the methodology is like neural networks, for instance, versus more symbolic approaches, as well as the philosophical questions around the ethics of AI and automation. A lot of those things have been being hashed out for decades. And so there, there's a ton of great books, some more modern, some you know from the, the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. Um, so a couple, a few books, I guess, that I would recommend that I think are really worth reading. One is a book from the 70s called Girdle Escher Bach. It's very abstract, but uh, it talks about, it kind of interweaves a lot of different topics across music and mathematics and language to sort of get at the question of what is intelligence and how realistic or not realistic is it to, to think that we could program that into machines. Um, that's kind of a, like a, 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 an all-time classic in the field of AI. Um, and then more, I guess more recent, I'm looking at my bookshelf to try to think, think of other, other top books I would recommend. There's a, uh, a book on the, on the topic of um, kind of the, the ethics of AI and specifically responsible AI that I just recently read that I liked a lot. It's called The Alignment Problem. Um, and I think this is, this is very quickly moving from a philosophical question to like a very practical, important kind of operational question around how do we make sure that the AI we build shares the value that we do if we're letting it go off and make decisions and so forth. So this book, The Alignment Problem is, is one of the best reads I've, I've come across in terms of unpacking that issue and putting forth possible ways that you would go about resolving it. Well, that's super cool. Definitely very great recommendations that will make these titles uh, available in the show notes. Rob, I can't thank you enough for your time today. It was very short and insightful conversation. Um, personally, I learned quite a bit. You were very generous with some of the information you've shared. Uh, just like with all of the podcast guests, I love doing the follow-up recording in about a year where we revisit the conversation from a year ago and see if everything that we've discussed still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you as well. That sounds great. Thanks so much, John. It was a pleasure chatting.